Brian, welcome. Hey, yeah, I was. Am I? I realized that I had not actually ushered myself on stage. Yeah. The reason. Yeah. That you were waiting for me to join because. I just you know, thought I, you know we thought we'd wait for you. It's very courteous. Not to stand on ceremony. <laughs> Claire, how are you? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm doing well. It's good to good to hear your voice live. Yeah, it's nice nice to e meet you ever and Adam as well. And this is going to be fun. It's going to be fun. So actually, before we get started, so we had uh, Adam. We were we were off last week. We had uh, the open source firmware conference last week, right? And uh, had a bunch of folks um, up at Oxide on Tuesday night, and I got to say, we had a lot of uh, fans of the pod, as they say. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, that's great. Yeah, it was do, you sell it was some, st- do you sell some stickers? You know, I, I did. I got some stickers, but I got to say, I, you know, a lot of people were uh, were asking after you. I to the oh. point where I was like, you know, but I, but I'm here, and they're like, yes. <laughs> but where's Adam? Yeah, I'm fine. I know you, you kind of said that but earlier. Where's Adam actually? Um, <laughs> that's so that's great. Fully here. That's that's great. I was just entertaining my folks, so uh, I, I should have told them I need, I had somewhere else to be. Yeah, you will listen. Like, look, you're a nerd celebrity. You got to get out and, <laughs> and uh, you know be with your people. Um, but no, it was well, great. It, honestly, it was it was very great. It was a lot of fun to have uh, terrific conversations with folks that are loving the and and Connor. I know you've gone through our back catalog just as we've gone through yours, and it's been uh, a lot of fun to to uh, be hearing from folks that we're having conversations that they're finding interesting. Which is great. Um, cause of course, uh, we find them delightful, <laughs> so it's good. Glad you also enjoy it. Uh, and then we were in the so the, the conference itself was uh, was down in Sunnyvale um, at the Google campus, and uh, I was driving all of the. Uh, we had a, a couple of Oxide folks out here, folks that have been on the podcast before. So uh, Laura Abbott and Cliff Biffle and Matt Keeter um, were all giving, and then Ben Stoltz also out here. The uh, but was staying down there. But so I was. Uh, shuttling all four of us down from the East Bay, and uh, we were uh, so we had we had some some long commutes. I mean, that's a that's a widowmaker yeah. of a commute from that's the, the drive, from the, yeah, just just brutal. Um, and uh, I mean, it was much better when we got in the kind of the high occupancy way and so on. But we were it was actually a good week to do it because we were getting the play by play of the SBF trial. Are you paying? How, how <laughs> are you paying attention to this thing at all? I just. Just the teeniest bit that filters through on Twitter and other things, like uh, the, apparently um, Shakespeare, like mathematically overrated. Oh my god! Oh my goodness! Yes, they did not. They they did not. You know, I don't think they actually. We heard them talking about that too much. Connor, have you been following this closely? This SBF trial. I do not. I see every once in a while a YouTube video that recaps the drama, but. Um, no, I mean, I know the, the high-level details, but have not been following. I mean, it feels like you're judging us, those who live in the sewer. <laughs> Are you, am I, am I trying to read that in? Like, look, look, we need our, we, we need our, our drama, okay? We need, we, we need our soap opera. Uh, and so, Adam, do you want to explain what the, the, the Shakespeare reference is? Because that was, that was, I mean, there's a lot that's bonkers about this thing. I'll try. Was- so th- this was SBF basically saying that, um, you know, statistically, because so many people have lived since Shakespeare, that there's no way that Shakespeare could have been the greatest author of all time because surely like billions and billions of people have lived since and one of them must be the greatest authors of all time. And leaning that logic on Bayes, which many hasten to point out, had (laughs) lived kind of a long time ago. I kind of love this idea of Adam Leventhal reads your least favorite (laughs) SPF positions and just like (laughs) just kind of listening to you squirm about a position that like, I'd see. I ardently disagree with literally everything about this, but you're making me repeat it. So how do I do this? <laughs> how do I hold this up with as few fingers as possible? As few fingers as possible. Totally unhinged. First of all, it's like in response to the greatest straw man of all time. Like who? Who's he in an argument with? Who's like? I, it, just, it was so unbelievably. And also for a person who's like a master of probabilities, uh, he did you see the other one about like if there was a coin that you could flip. And there was a, with a fifty percent odds that that the world will be annihilated, and a fifty percent uh, fifty percent chance that 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 everyone's happiness will be doubled. He would enthusiastically flip the coin, and apparently, uh, at least what uh, what uh, what Matt was saying is like, no, he would enthusiastically keep flipping the coin. 
what? <laughs> um, but so it was, it, we, we were getting the play by play. It is, it, it is jaw dropping. Um, Matt had another great line, which is like, I just want to live my life such that my chats are never entered into evidence because they, <laughs> they sound like <laughs> such absolute idiots. They, I mean, and they are at some, like some real level, they are kind of all idiots, but, uh, they really sound like it. And the, so that the podcast I'd recommend on this which is not one that I would normally listen to, but it's a crypto podcast, which is like, boy, am I, I'm, I'm, mm, I'm in. Okay. Yeah, I know, Listening. right? It, right, exactly. Uh, so this is Unchained with Laura Shin. And she's, a, got, she's got some very, very good reportage on this. Um, and is really, and actually I love, she's been basically reading elements of the transcript. She's got some commentary on there that's incredibly good. She has these two attorneys that that ha- are on there as regulars. And I don't know if this is bothered you, but one of them pronounces Alameda Research as Alameda Research. Hmm. Have you heard Alameda? People say Alameda because Al- I, I, Alameda. I, is I live reasonable. in Alameda. I've definitely heard Alameda, or lots of variants there. Right. So this is so, and I mean, Adam, you live on you. You and I both live in the county of Alameda. You True. live on on the island. Of Alameda. I mean, it's like there, there's a lot of we got a lot of Alamedas in our lives, and it's that's right. folks. It's not Alameda, please. Um, <laughs> well, I will I will share because you mentioned that for like the early days of uh, of like the SBF unfolding of of the exchange of FTX and so forth. I was like, um, the, there's that woman who was you know the president of um, Alameda Research. And I was like, wait a minute, she's not our mayor. What's going on here? As I kind of barely paid attention to this and got confused. You got confused between the president of Alameda Research and the... Oh, just like uh, I didn't realize Alameda uh, Research had anything to do with FTX. I was just like, I I just stopped at Alameda, I guess. Because right. I'm such a ho- Alameda homer. Right, exactly. I know, and people are pointing out this may be the original Portuguese p- pronunciation. So, you know, it did, I did actually wonder, and Adam, it did remind me of your Gelsinger... Jassy on premise, mm-hmm. on premise with Supercut, in that yeah. uh, Laura is very clearly saying Alameda over and over to him, and he is saying back Alameda over and over to her. So it's like you are each clearly aware that the other says, so Maybe we're pronouncing <laughs> wrong. Maybe we there do we live in Alameda County. Maybe we've been wrong all along. Connor, one of the things we've definitely learned in this podcast is that we mispronounce everything. I mispronounce everything. I guess I should I should really make this much more specific. Oh, and I just avoid any word that I'm not sure of. So, I mean, who who is really the fool here? Right. Right. One of us is a chicken, the other the other is a jackass. You get to pick who's who is right. who's who here. Um anyway, so that was fun. That was that was a uh, it was a, a fun week. Um and uh, thinking a lot about the podcast. Uh, but it's so that is not why we're here. We are not here to talk about SBF. We are here to settle beef. We are here because so Connor, I was out at Monktoberfest, um, which and Adam, you've never been to Monktoberfest, right? This, never been, this been on, yeah. almost went this year. But had to cancel again because the aforementioned visit from my folks. Yes, and the uh, great conference. Obviously, I'm very grateful to Stephen O'Grady um, and his crew there at Red Monk. They do a terrific job and have a bunch of talks that that we don't necessarily see anywhere else, which I'm very grateful for. And I've had I've been privileged to speak there a couple of times. Uh, I'm really excited to get the. Uh, the I have a talk on, uh, on the, the humanity and engineering. Um, so it's trying to to uh, quell some of the fears about the uh, the AI singularity. Um, so looking forward to that video coming up. Um, but it was on the way back that I listened to this podcast. Um, and uh, this is the uh, Algorithms Plus Data Structures Equals Programs podcast. Connor, this is your podcast. Yep. Uh, which, which I've definitely listened to from time to time. Um, and I, I, I've definitely enjoyed. And I uh, came across the transom and I, we, were, uh, we were getting called out a little bit. A little bit of a bit of podcast beef, um, which I have to say, Connor, we were delighted by just like, just to set the stage. We really enjoyed it. Uh, and we know that you, and I've just followed you online and know that you're a, a big fan of podcast. So Connor, I thought if, if you don't mind, I thought we might start with the, the thing that we said that you were quoting back to your co-host Bryce. Is that a fair place to start? Sounds good. All right. So we okay. are going to start. Adam, is that um, the, absolutely? Uh, this is using soundboard technology, which we have never tried before. So let's give it a shot. Let's give it a shot. So, so this is, beautiful C plus yeah. is to you is just like this is why we should have Rust. This is not. 
It's, I mean, it, it is, it is a, I, I'd actually recommend it. Like, I, I think it's an interesting book. <laughs> I think no, no, you're going to put I, that on the back jacket. I'd, I'd, I'd actually <laughs> recommend it. Raves, Adam Levithal. Well, I, I, I did, I do want to like, see if I can get, so the, the authors are Guy Davidson and Kate Gregory. And I would be very interested to see, and I, I've looked all over to see if they acknowledge Rust. And the closest I could find on Twitter was Guy Davidson saying, I don't really have time to try new languages. <laughs> which, is, which is such a shame. Yeah, yeah that's because yeah. these are these are folks who who really have nuanced, deep thinking on on this you know very important language. This is not the disparage C plus plus, but one that they they are themselves ready to acknowledge the burrs and the mistakes of. And um, you know, I'd love to see what they think of Rust, just because I feel like seriously, like every page is just more and more of an advertisement I for it. And when when you get into like concepts. Like concept, it, concept is a concept in C plus plus. Whoa, and yes, I had not. Heard what, there's a thing called concepts. There's a thing called concepts okay. that is a, a bit like a trait. Okay, but people are going to like be pillory me for, for for making that kind of uh, like gross an, uh, uh, analogy there. But it, it, you know, it's um, it, it's for describing the characteristics of a template. You know, the, the type T needs to obey these these parameters. Huh. Okay, all right. I, I really, I got to say, p people like this are the reason that, that, that people dislike Rust. All right. Adam, and not like on a technical people, level. What do you mean people dislike Rust? It's the number one most loved language in the world. Like right, in a row. But the, but all right. That's the, so... Connor, first of all, I we loved your. I would actually, first of all, first of all, if you had told me that like there's a clip from the show about C plus plus that people are going to uh, run with, um, this I feel is uh, you took one of our most gentle assessments of C plus plus. I feel like we said much worse about C plus <laughs> plus. I'm aware. I'm aware. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I gotta say, I think thank you for not pointing out to your co-host being like, oh, by the way, like, sorry, do you want me to get like the actual deep cuts on C? Like they've said all sorts of like there's no analog in here to substance abuse, to uh to to uh teenage sexual behavior, to I mean, out of one of the other things we've used as a metaphor for C. I feel like there's all sorts of things that we've used. Yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely like drug use, like with, uh, with your child or whatever. And, and certainly when I think Brian, you DM'd me like, Oh, that one of our shitty hot takes was the subject of another podcast. This felt like we got lucky. <laughs> well, so, uh, yeah. With, so tell us about like that clip and how, kind of how it spoke to you. Um, and, uh, they can kind of take it from there. I mean, this is going to sound absurd, um, but yes, I, I have a habit of the podcasts that I, I listen to, you know, 70 plus podcasts. Um, I'm a huge podcast fan and I have a short, I have a short list. I listen to these all at like 2.3 times speed. And so, and uh, I spend a lot of time uh, running around like for exercise. So huge podcast fan, but I was actually listening um, and, and, and Oxide and Friends I wish way more companies like a, a huge kudos to to both of you and all of the folks in the past that have you know spoke up on these. Um, there are very few podcasts like this, and I mean, Why I just is that? Uh, like, yeah, <laughs> I, I, it feels I, like this is like super light lift. I mean, uh, so I mean, part of the goal. Well, we're going on a tangent here, so we'll, we'll get back to how I uh, I came to splicing that clip in. But you know, Sean Parent, who I'm not sure if either of you are familiar with, but is a, a luminary. I mean, I guess uh, you listened to the Sean Parent episode, um, which was amazing. delightful. Yeah. yeah, yeah, amazing. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll we'll drop a link to this. But this, and you've had Sean Parent on a couple of times. But yeah, um, yeah, the particular episode that I think Adam and I both listened to was this absolutely nutty story of a car crash that he was in and a, i mean i'm not gonna I, i'm not gonna give any more context other than that i thought it, it's an amazing story that definitely captures like a moment in history in computing mm -hmm. history honestly yeah but uh, so he you know i've i've looked up to sean and uh i'm happy to, like to be able to call him a friend these days but back in 2017 18 to like to me he was just a person that i had seen his talks online and once I had gotten to meet him, 
I, I asked him, you know, how come you don't start a podcast? Like there are not, I think you used the word, you know, seasoned in your social audio talk, Brian, like seasoned folks that have experience, you know, there's, there's too many, <laughs> Uh, no offense to everyone with a podcast, like myself included, like, you know, I was born in the 90s, like there's too many young people, you know, putting out their their thoughts and opinions and not enough folks with like real experience and, and decades of war stories or, you know, choose the better word for war stories. And I asked him, like, how come you don't start a podcast? And he just, I think a lot of those folks aren't interested. And he said, if you start a podcast, I will be happy to come on, like, however often or frequent that you want me to. You're and like, so, uh, we, sure, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, you can do that. And so we've had him on, I think, four or five different times, and we oh, usually amazing. slice and dice them up. And like most recently, we were at a conference in uh, Folkestone, UK, in uh, June at a C plus plus conference, and like over wine and like an hour and a half, we like got to talk to him about you know how he ended up at Adobe when he was at you know Apple before, where, where he likes to say like in between jobs, and and he you know I think. You've referred, uh, Brian, to folks that have this just like amazing storytelling capabilities, but then also like amazing stories to go with that. And Sean is one of these people. And it's just, it's a blast. Anyway, so why more folks don't do it? I think it's just, it's work. And um, a lot of these folks aren't interested in, you know, trying to set that up. But like, I think the key is, it's like, if you're interested in having those conversations, you'd be surprised how willing some of these folks are. Uh, to, to, you know, do the storytelling part as long as they don't need to do any of the work of it. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm not sure if you want to add anything on, on your yeah, thoughts no, on why more people point. don't do this. It's a great point. And, you kind of, and we definitely had that feeling with On the Metal where we had, you know, these kind of uh, folks giving these unbelievable stories and uh, excited to do it, excited to, to kind of volunteer their time to do it. So, and I would also say for whatever it's worth, I think it's great to get uh, folks in the nineties, born in the nineties too. I think it's, I, I love getting all those different perspectives. Um, and I, I, I do, and Connor, I'm not sure if you saw, I give a talk on, on social audio and kind of what I, the social audio as a vector for engineering wisdom based on our experience with Oxide and friends um, that, that if you haven't seen would definitely resonate with you. But the, uh, I, I, I do actually, I would love more folks to do this. Um, and if you do, like, let us know. And Connor, I guess, I, I also want to go back to 70 podcasts. Are you a, you are a regular listener of 70 different podcasts? Yeah, I mean, subtract maybe like 15 of those that like don't actively post. Um, sure. So it's not, but like, in, I counted in my app uh, a few days ago because I'm always curious. And, and yeah, uh, yeah, I, I just, I think it's people underestimate like the utility and like i did watch your social audio talk you recommended oh, yeah, it oh, nice. yeah, yeah, yeah. and i would have i mean i think i thought it was fantastic preaching to the choir uh the only thing i would say is like it's it would have had like a catchier title with like the power of podcasting or something like that um <laughs> but uh I, yeah i wish i wish more people would do it oh, and oh, like these, these, these whippersnappers trying to uh, trying to uh, gen z up my title i don't know <laughs> spicing up that yeah it's it's unfortunate, like on YouTube, the number, the two things that uh, affect how well a talk does or like a video does, like number one is thumbnail and number two is title. Like you'd think that the content matters most, but like that's number three after those two, um, which is, I don't know, it is what it is. Uh, I'm going to have to bring you in as a, as a title consultant. Um, <laughs> sure. And then, and then I'll need to, I will need to run it by my kids to see if it's, if it's actually, <laughs> if it's actually cringy or not, my teenagers who are... Um, who, who serve as a Gen Z slang check for me, make sure that I'm not being, I want to, you know, I want to say things are lit out and I'm told that like, no dad, you say it. it just sounds ridiculous. Please don't. Um, I although saw, I, I saw do TikTok once where kids were, were some young, that, that was like Gen Z talk. And I didn't understand at all what was, what was said. And like, I was just like, wow, I guess I'm old now. Cause this, this, this speak that they are speaking uh, is foreign to me. Uh, well, so I do have to say, yeah, I mean, this is where Adam and I do have an advantage. On the one hand, we are are, are older, and this is not our generation. On the other hand, Adam and I both have teenagers, so mm -hmm. we actually uh, are a bit the more... The Rosetta conversant. Stone, yeah. Rosetta Stone, and I, there is some Gen Z slang that is delightful. Um, Adam, the, 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 uh, the two that I think are just terrific are uh, one, mid, as do you use mid? I think mid is terrific. I don't know, mid. Oh, I actually like, looked that up. That was in the video, and I, I urban <laughs> dictionaryed it. Uh. <laughs> yeah, a mid is. I mean, and mid is what you would expect it to be. Like if I said, like you know, how how's that burrito? It's like it's mid. Huh. It's like a, gotcha. Yeah, you know, 
The other yeah, one's got to be Rizzy. No. Rizzy's got to be your other one. Absolutely is Riz. Yeah, the other one yeah. is Riz. I think I, I think Riz and Riz to me is serves as like a testament to the English language about how <laughs> then Gen Z uses it. It's like all parts of speech. Um and um the and I actually I came across this when uh I when one of my when my son and one of his friends was looking at at his father, um and we are at you know an event where he is talking to two other women parents and he said look at that guy the rizzler and i'm like the rizzler? <laughs> what is the what is the rizzler um but anyway riz is is, is terrific um my understanding so yeah, I, of, I, of the word mid is actually or according to what i googled was that mid is actually like a very bad insult because it's you would rather be at the extremes like the best or the worst because like that'll oh, that'll sure. track online whereas mid yeah. It's actually like you're just in the middle of the bell curve and like no one's going to care. So like you'd rather actually be like really bad than mid, uh, huh. which is confusing to me. But hey, you know, kids these days. Yeah. So, I mean, actually, my criticism of GPT from a writing perspective is its writing is mid. That is actually the problem with GPT is, I mean, almost tautologically is that it's that it's mid. Um, so. Uh, but yeah, I kind of, I'm gonna have to, I'll, I'll consult you, but then I'll, I'll, I, I hear what you're saying that the, the, the titles simply do not, do not, uh, are too descriptive. I'm not, you know, it, it is, it reminds me of, of the criticism we heard from the original oxide pitch deck, which is like, this is very good, but it's full of words. I'm like, it's full. okay. Yes, it is. Full. Yeah. I mean, there's, <laughs> yes, well, to be words. clear, as opposed to there being any pictures. Well, Okay. No, there are, they, but there are, there are words. There are words. I, I'm just like, look, I'm, I'm like, I'm pro literacy. I'm just, I'm That's long right. literacy. There we go. And, and yeah, it's they're, they're words. Maybe not so many pictures, but but definitely words. So yeah, so Connor, um, you so you listen to a ton of podcasts, um, and I, I, we, I guess I would look to you then as a as a, like an early barometer for some of the ones that are particularly stand out to you, because uh, I would love for a bunch of others to be like like us and like you and kind of capturing these narratives from technologists and you've got you've gotten a lot of them you've got a lot of different folks um on on adsp it's pretty awesome yeah i mean so yeah we'll second tangent we'll, and we'll get back to you know when i was listening to that episode but i mean i think it's it's very individual uh i'm a huge programming language enthusiast like my favorite languages over time you know at, w at one point it was haskell uh, in the last four years it's all been array languages of which I think the very first time I came across your name, Brian, was not a talk. It was actually the article where uh, the artif articleification of your interview with Arthur Whitney, who is Arthur Whitney. Uh, yeah, I, he, I, I, yeah, I wondered if you'd seen that um, because you you had a podcast you're talking about Q and K. Um, yeah. yeah, my second podcast, uh, a Raycast, um, has been going on for three years now, sixty episodes, and it's all about uh, APL and other array languages like JK, Q, uh, BQN, very recently a language that just came out in the last couple of weeks, WIWA, that's U-I-U-A, which is super interesting. It's a symbolic language like APL that combines a stack from like concatenative languages like Factor, Forth, and Joy, and sort of the APL array paradigm. That's a whole other episode topic. But so I, I love the programming language episodes for sure um especially the drama ones like i think recently or in the last couple months when the rust you know leadership stuff was going on and open source stuff like you've had a couple different episodes where you brought folks on and i i just love that intersection of you know drama and uh, the in, the the inner workings or inside baseball of that stuff i also love all of the books episodes that you i mean this was one of them um yeah. <laughs> where you go through different books and uh, I haven't actually read uh, the next book with Steve Jobs, but I have like a bunch in my audiobooks uh, or Audible account and on my list to read. And uh, especially like just the history ones where you're talking about your time at Sun Microsystems. Like that's the stuff that's, in my opinion, like going to be forgotten in the annals of time if, if it doesn't get recorded on a podcast, uh, which is why I think it's, it's, it's so like valuable to... I mean, there is a YouTube channel called... Oral, oral computer history, but like those oh, are yeah. pretty, from, pretty from the dry. Computer history museum. Computer history museum are amazing. Yeah. And yeah. those, those are like three hours in length and YouTube videos. And so I haven't watched a lot, but um, yeah, like I think that kind of stuff, but you, you, the way it's packaged here, it's more, you know, uh, interactive with folks in the crowd. 
and it's just, I think, more uh, entertaining. Whereas I, I've listened to some of the oral ones, and and they're definitely not. It's just a back and forth kind of, um, you know, storytelling. Uh, anyway, so yeah, the the book ones, the his, history ones, the programming language ones, um, those are probably uh, at the top of my my favorites. Yeah, probably. that's awesome. I'm really glad that you like that. I mean, I think Adam, you and I both love. Books episodes, in part oh, yeah. because I, we come out of every single one of those with like a really interesting cue, and then it's great to go like read some of those books and and kind of come back for more. I mean, I, I, that's been I'm glad that you like this kind. I've been uh, it's those have been really really fun to do um, and to learn. I, I again learned like I, I've also learned that I will basically uh, take whatever whatever Ian is is reading. I will basically you could just like move that cue right on over to me. Um, I, but there've been some great recommendations on that. It's great. Yeah. Speaking of which, it's a great yeah. way to circle back to. So I was in uh, Vietnam for a wedding in September and oh, nice. uh, was in, and this, this gets back to how I was listening to this. Uh, I was in Thailand before I was in uh, Vietnam and uh, without going into detail, I'm I'm also a very uh, a, I'm an obsessive podcast listener, but also an obsessive runner. Um, and I was I actually wasn't on a run; I was on a walk because I had run that morning. And I was just walking randomly next to this highway because there's a website that I'm addicted to right now called CitySTrides.com that like tracks your completion of streets wherever you go, and you get like ranked on a global leaderboard. And so. If I'm ever, you know, have some free time and I'm in a new city, I just want to go walk around and like collect nodes to like increase my ranking. And so here I am walking on the side of this like highway to get to this really dense cluster of streets. And I'm going through, I'm like my podcast queue of new episodes is empty and I'm going through the backlog and... You know, I am expecting a great episode because I love these books one, but then boom, like sure enough, in the first 10 minutes, you're talking about a book that uh, both my co-host Bryce and I have talked about before. And Kate Gregory, one of the co-authors we've had on as a guest, and she actually lives just outside of Toronto, Canada, which is where I currently live. And she's involved in running the CPP North uh, C++ conference that's happened for the last two years. So like Kate and I know each other very well. And, and anyway, so it's just like the, the colliding of worlds and it's on top of a lot of uh, discussion around successor initiatives and language languages such as, you know, carbon out of Google, uh, CPP front or CPP two out of not really Microsoft, but Herb Sutter, who is the chair of the ISO committee. Uh, there's Hilo out of, which was formerly named Val out of uh, Adobe. There's a, a next generation, you know, um, bleeding edge compiler called Circle out of one individual by the name of Sean Baxter, who's in New York. So there's all this stuff happening around. And then you can add Rust as, you know, uh, uh, contributing to the discussion of, you know, is C++, you know, has it had its peak and it's now sunsetting or is it going to go through a winter and, you know, the, the 20 aughts or whatever up until 2011 was kind of a dark period for C++. And there's a, so a lot of discussion that's been happening over the last year. And I just finished listening to a CPP cast episode where they were talking about sort of some of the work on the next big language features. It, it had been stalling in the committee. And so, you know, I, I'd heard that clip and was like, oh, that's not great. And then I heard this episode, which technically is from, you know, the history, uh, you know, the backlog. And I was just, I had the biggest grin. I think I was even laughing while you guys were like, that, that, there's the, the two bits where I knew I was going to cut in where one, it, it was the, it's basically just an advertisement for Russ, this book. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, people in the C++ community are saying, you know, oh, this is a great book. It's actually what it does is it takes 30 of these guidelines that are recommended in what are called the modern C++ core guidelines that sort of came out of Microsoft, but it's an open source thing that people contribute. So it's this, you know, okay, we have all these modern features, but here's some best practices that you should adhere to. And so they oh. took 30 of those and bookified it and basically add exa added examples. Um, but it's, it's completely... Well, it never mind. You have effective C++ then. Scott Myers' book. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there was four or five of those. And those were, I mean, I mean, he has famously said that the fact that he, those books exist are are like a stain on C++'s history. Like a good language shouldn't need a book telling you like, oh, here's how to, you know, avoid this anti-pattern. And, you know, we just in introduced, you know, universal references or forwarding references. And, you know, here's all the, the pitfalls with these and how to avoid them. Like, 
uh, I have never talked to Scott personally, but I've, I've heard him on interviews saying that like, I would prefer if I didn't have to write these books. Like it's sad. It's sad. These books are yes. Good. Have you ever seen Scott speak, Adam? Or have you? No, never. So you, he, he, you, we share an alma mater with him. He was oh, getting really? his PhD. Yeah, he was. He had just finished his PhD at Brown when I was an undergrad, and um, I, if memory serves, um, and so he, uh, and he's very funny. Uh, in particular, what I definitely remember on him is he had a Pascal rant and. Connor, I, I hate to do this to you, but Pascal, Pascal, please. <laughs> not the, 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 we mentioned the pronunciations earlier. Yeah. Pascal? It is really not Pascal. I, I, I Just listening to the most recent uh, the ADSP where I, 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 I feel like you were going into that conversation saying Pas, uh, Pascal, and then it, you were like changing to Pascal over the course. You were reminded of like, my wife is, is from New Zealand, and when she, she, when she would talk to her mom, uh, she would like, her accent would become like more Kiwi. And I feel like you were, you were, uh, and so yeah, I, I would, I think we say Pascal, but I have the same problem with Java and Java. Like, I think I switch between the two when I'm talking. Well, about that's a language. North of the border thing. I mean, that's, yeah, it's not a cultural thing. I feel like that's yeah. like a, I feel like you're entitled to, to Java and ZFS. I feel is like that's right. your, that, that is your, your birthright as, as a proud Canadian. I think I've got kind of O Canada in my head when I'm, um, <laughs> All right, Pascal, going forward. We'll you know, do I've, our got best. My, I've got my Molson light in my hand. I'm watching the Argos <laughs> take on the tie cap. <laughs> no. Have you ever watched a CFL game? Adam, have we already had this conversation? I've only watched clips of the CFL. The CFL is amazing. And it, it is and amazing. It is amazing. And I, 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 I hear your tone. And on behalf of all Canadians, I find it offensive. And I think that you would love it. No, no, no. I mean, I mostly watch it like I watch all sports, which is on John Boy as clips. The, John Boy would love the CFL. Has he done something? He does love the CFL? the CFL. Yes, he would love the CF. The CFL. I love that man. I absolutely yeah. love John Boy. Uh, CFL is terrific. Anyway, the, uh, the you you are entitled to your ZFS and your and your Java, but you may not have Pascal. That is not a Canadian thing. That is a that's, <laughs> that, step too far. I said it's a step too far. We're gonna you you you, you can have um. You know what they they also and I'm not sure if this is a Canadian thing or not. Uh, the Canadians that I worked with called it called vi vi which is kind of a that's a kind of a wild one um I, I don't know if that's a canadian thing or not but i think i'm just it's, gonna I have think, to clip this from i have to cut this from the show it's gonna be too controversial, it be too controversial. <laughs> we're gonna get we're gonna get lit up it's like in our attempt to settle beef with one podcast we like picked fights with 15 others I, we're, we're gonna be on yeah i uh, uh we're uh Going to be a on the GI Daily. Turns out yeah. has a podcast that has got a. a we're going to be on a, a Quebecois <laughs> podcast. It's going to. Um, Lucien Bouchard humor probably doesn't. I don't know if that, that really plays with the Oxide Friends audience. Um, Perizo, where can I go here? Um, Jean Chrétien. These are actually, you know, I realize these are Canadian politicians that predate you, Connor. You may be like, I, I don't even know who these people are because this is like, I, yeah, sorry, I'm just like not up on my <laughs> early '90s <laughs> Canadian history. <laughs> I was alive when uh, I think Jean Chrétien was was PM, so I, I definitely right, know, there who, you go. know who he okay. is. Uh, yeah, I, I, I got Tom McGrath finally. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> I gotta make it like a. Uh, but but Brian Mulroney, I think we can all forget. Uh, sorry, we'll, we'll get off of Prime Ministers of Canada here. Um, the um, but so Scott Myers had a rant on Pascal that is terrific, and in particular, so if you were, you, you, I, I take it from your podcast, you never implemented in Pascal, Connor. No, I have not. It's one of, um, I was going to say few, but it's one of many languages I have not written. Yeah, and it's not, well, I mean, it's, it, it's not, this is not like a bucket list thing. Um, this is not like, although I am kind of, I, I, I do kind of like the idea of just like your gamified running of city streets. We need like a city strides for programming languages, maybe that like you've got to do. <laughs> um, I, I, we can gamify that. Um, but the, um, so the, this is not necessarily a bucket list item. I would say that because one of the questions that you guys actually pose, and we're going to a little bit out of order here, but one of the questions you pose in your follow-up podcast is in terms of like why C, why what versus why Pascal or why Ada. Pascal actually was the systems language for the Mac in particular, and mm -hmm. not just the Mac. I mean, there were there were actually uh, quite a few systems for which Pascal was the systems language. You can view Pascal as basically C, more or less. It is the moral equivalent of C. It's it makes. And now and we're gonna have to we're gonna have to actually remove that too. We're gonna end up now. Yeah, yeah. We, we have a very short episode. War on the Pascal <laughs> podcasts are now gonna come after us. Like they said, what? No, this is war. this is war. We actually have beef. Uh, the um, but Pascal is very very similar. Um, and 
Pascal, but one of the differences is that in C, I mean, infamously, famously, you have the open brace, closed brace nomenclature to denote a block that's obviously been used by lots of other languages. Um, in Pascal, it is begin and end. And every end in the program has a semicolon, except for the last end in the program, which has a period. And the program begins with program. And it has to end with end period. And uh, there's just this great Scott Myers rant on like, why? Why does the last end have a period? By the way, like every Pascal compiler knows this. And if you make this mistake, it will tell you, by the way, the last end in your program has a semicolon. It needs a period. It's like, you're a computer. You know it's the last end. You put one there. Uh, it was actually really, uh, really pretty funny. Um, and and Dan is calling me out that it is a statement separator, not a terminator. Well, then you and there you go. So uh, Dan Cross in the chat, very strongly supporting Pascal's uh, period as a program terminator as opposed to a statement separator, which I, I it sure is like delightful to explain to somebody who's just learning how to program for the first time <laughs> in, in in Pascal. Um, but anyway, Scott Myers is someone I, I really enjoyed. Uh, I'm not sure how much of his stuff has kind of, is he, is he still active in the C++ community, Connor? No, he retired a few years ago because when I first started, I think attending conferences in 2019 was the first one I went to. I think I'd heard that, yeah, he, he was in retirement and no longer actively attends or speaks or, or is writing or anything like that. He has moved to a commune in Vermont and will deal with an <laughs> operator no shorter than a comma. I'm trying to make this all a new machine. <laughs> uh, yeah, I will, I will no longer overload op. I've overloaded my last operator says, says uh, Scott Myers. Um, all right. So you, uh, you got the clip. Um, you, you played it for the, the, the co-host. I, I guess I, we, we were a little surprised at the reaction. I think you were a little surprised at the reaction. Is that a, is that a, Correct statement. Well, definitely. Well, I, sh I should circle back and say too the the second sure. clip that I I just was killing myself laughing like w while on this walk in in Thailand <laughs> was uh, when when uh, Adam you said there's a concept called concepts and then Brian, <laughs> you go you go whoa there's a, there's a thing called concepts and then you say yeah there's a thing called so like in uh, in like five seconds I think concepts is said like six times and just the bewilderment of you Brian that. Uh, that there's a concept called concept. It was just it was just podcast gold, and I, so I knew I, I, knew I was going to tell Brian this, and I knew we were moments away from who's on first, and it was going to take like <laughs> ten minutes to unwind. Yes, yeah. that's the concept. Like, what's the no, concept called? Concept. Right. concept. That's what I'm asking. <laughs> it was so good, and uh, and so I'm just, like the whole podcast start to finish is amazing, but that first 10, 15 minutes, and so I knew I was going to go and. Like instantly after listening to it, I was like, I got to play this for Bryce to get his reaction. Because I think we are both on the same page as is, you know, uh, indicated by our discussion that followed is that C++ from a process perspective is in like a very bad place. And there seems to be like a lack of acknowledgement of like every other modern language, you know, Russ Swift, insert modern programming language that development happens asynchronously, not in person three times a year at these committee meetings that are very gatekeepy in terms of like having the money or the sponsorship to go. And, uh, you know, it's the folks that are in power, you know, and, and don't get me wrong, they're, they are volunteers that are putting in their volunteer time. It's, it's nothing against like the individuals that are going. It's just, it's been shown that there's a better way to do uh, language and library evolution uh, that it does not require hopping on a plane with like, you know, a huge carbon footprint, et cetera, et cetera. And so I thought he was just going to agree <laughs> with basically <laughs> everything I said. And I'm not sure. No. I mean, Bryce, I'm, he probably won't listen to this because he famously doesn't really listen to podcasts. Um, he, I think maybe because he said he gave the book his endorsement that he felt uh, like he kind of had to d defend the C++ side of things. Um, and also, too, at the tail, because we had recorded two episodes back to back, and we had just finished saying that we thought, you know, C++ was in bad shape. And I think he had said something like, you know, they weren't going to sh ship any language features. And so, yeah, I was a bit surprised at his, his reaction. And also, too, it, I mean, he did acknowledge that. I thought it was a, not to call Bryce uh, hypocritical, but, you know, he also has a ton of very hot, spicy takes, which is why I think he makes for an amazing podcast uh, co-host because he says things that gets reactions out of people 
And I think it's all mission you know, accomplished there. Definitely mission accomplished. I mean, yeah. he did, and you got to give I got to give Bryce credit. He did say one thing. I mean, I guess like because with you, you didn't give him any context, and he didn't ask for any context. He's just like, all right, <laughs> that's all I need. Like I I got this loaded revolver. Time to start firing it. And I gotta say, he did like absolutely nail the target in one of these. Adam, do you have a clip of of Bryce just absolutely yes. nailing me? Yes, yes, I do. Brian Cantrell was one of the voices. And he actually was a C and C++ developer uh, from years ago, but has just not used the language Yeah, recently. well, he hasn't been a C++ developer since, like, the 90s, I'm going to guess. I mean, spot on. Busted. <laughs> just absolutely busted. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so just to be clear, I have not... There was actually a time when I had developed more C, much more C++ than C. So I did a lot of C++ in it, but it was all in the nineties. So Bryce has as an uh, undergraduate, right? Like, uh, yeah, yeah. Or okay, just just and, checking. Well, and also I was like a big advocate for it. So like I moved hmm. the operating system course from C to C plus plus. And the, did you not know that? Uh, no, but I'll that talk right? about okay. that later. I, I, I that's that's not something last week discussed that. Okay, but like you, you, it sounds like you are okay. I'm not actually you, now. You, I know who to blame. Is what I'm saying exactly. Yeah, that's what I. Um, and I just I, you, you know because I took this is in like '93 and C plus plus was the kind of the hot thing and uh, it was the hot thing for a bunch of I mean there were a bunch of interesting ideas in there and I think that actually and kind of I would love your take on this. I think that part of the challenge that C plus plus has had is they, to the best of my knowledge, never really discarded an idea. That like when an idea gets into the language, it stays. Because more than anything, they have enshrined compatibility. Compatibility with C, compatibility with old C++. I'm not sure, maybe this has changed in the last, I mean, it would be very reasonable for this to have changed in the last 20 years. I know a lot has changed. Um, but certainly at the time, the fact that you could compile C as C++ was really important. And that, uh, but that it also led to a bunch of things that were then going to be design decisions that were going to be have were going to be pretty consequential because of that compatibility. No, that's, 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 true? that's, that's entirely correct. And I will say, uh, cause I want to comment on, I, I do know, I think one of your best talks, Brian is the summer of rust. And I think when I watched it a couple of years ago, the top comment at the time was, cause I think it's an hour and a half or two hour talk. The top comment at the time was I'm 50 minutes and the talk is entitled The Summer of Rust. <laughs> and the top comment was, I'm 50 minutes into this talk, and this guy hasn't mentioned Rust once, and I'm absolutely <laughs> loving it. Because, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that, that and, and, and then the reason I bring it up is in that talk, I believe that's the talk where you use the slightly edgy analogy of C++ being like an ex-girlfriend that took all your yeah. clothes and threw them out on the street and lit them on fire. And I, I understand that C++ is doing great now. They got all these new modern features. I'm happy for you. But I just like, because of my experience, I can't go back. And I just, I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> that, that, that is exactly it. I mean, it is, it, I mean, almost like literally it. I mean, I had a uh, it, 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 it was, it's like, it's like this relationship from my past that, that was important to me at the time, but also crazy in hindsight that like left me with some wounds, uh, that took, and I think also because I had been such a C++ advocate that when I kind of flipped, I, and it was also at a time when to kind of like the prevailing zeitgeist was that C was absolutely dead. I mean, honestly, like C was much more dead in 1995 than say than C++ is today. I mean, I, I don't know what the analog would be today. I mean, closer, not quite COBOL, but um, I mean, it, it, it was just like, no one should ever do any C. That is clearly not going to be the future at all. And I had kind of, when I myself w had this moment, which I came like hours in, to I was trying to instantiate a list template and was running into two separate compiler bugs. So this is another important thing to know about my own personal experience is the compilers didn't work reliably. And Adam, I mean, you were, I mean, I don't think that they were completely working. You mean you were a couple years behind me, but not so far behind me that I'm sure you had some of the same issues with compilers yeah, misbehaving. 
Yes, and we were deep into like uh, templates being in vogue, and that's right. So even when they did work, you would get. I mean, I guess glass houses now with Rust, but uh, you would get inscrutable error messages that went on for pages and pages and ended in a seg vault. Right, and then and then the fix was to blow. I mean, at least in my day, the, anyone would tell you like, "Have you blown away the templates on DB file yet?" I mean, it's like you would need to like constantly having of course, to bl- right. blow away the compiler's internal state, and then like then it would work. And it, it, it is. You know, I, as as a developer, you know those things. Real, and this is part of the reason why tooling is so important because, like, that begins to chip away at you. And it, it, because it's like this is not related to my like what I'm actually trying to do. And the whole purpose of using templates is to save me time as a developer. Like that's ultimately what we're trying to do. We're trying to allow me to deliver a high quality, high performing software artifact faster. And every time I need to blow away templates.db, we undermine that particular value proposition. And I just broke. After this, like I had this, <laughs> I, I was trying to debug the, the these these, and I realized I had two separate compiler bugs. And Adam, you know, like when you when you are, you've got like two bugs in play, and it feels like they, they kind of reinforce one another in ways that feel random. That you can't get this like third behavior. And I was just like, I was so frustrated. And I'm like, why am I? I know how to write a linked list. I could just yeah, write like when you start list. like losing sight of like what was the actual problem I was trying to solve before I went six levels deep in this bug stack. Right. Yeah. You're like, why am I here? Like, why am I here? And that's when I kind of like walked away. And I'm like, I and my career was in C from that from more or less then on. And I actually kind of thought with Java that there would be no more C plus plus. Honestly, I mean, I. The, the, with the kind of the rise of Java, I'm like, I don't know why one would write C++. I think the answer to that is like people were trying, we, it was really around performance. I mean, Connor, I, correct mm-hmm. me what, what kind of your read is on C++ development post Java. I think the emphasis is on, I mean, Adam, is that, uh, is that a fair read? Is that the performance? I mean, I, absolutely. Because remember Google, early, really. early days, you didn't even have like a hotspot or, you know, some of the JIT stuff was very, you know, new. So, right. yeah, I mean, you were not writing high performance java right right and i think that like you know the it's a it's it's a challenge because like at what time should c plus plus probably have broken from its past uh and Mm. this is the what i would call the underbar underbar init underbar underbar problem (laughs) so this is the because the python the name of a constructor in python is underbar underbar init underbar underbar because when they introduced the uh, the idea of an object in Python, which I mean, someone who knows Python well can tell me this, but this is like in the early '90s, when there are when there is certainly you know one one thousandth of one percent of the total Python had been written, and they didn't want to break things, understandably. And but now you've got this wart that you've got to bring forward forever, and you know my daughter learning you know my 11 year old daughter learning programming is like what is this it's like yeah it's an underbar underbar and underbar right sorry it's just like don't get me started i'll point you to a talk and and you're you're right on you're right on like c plus plus i mean the point of or one of the big points of that beautiful c plus plus book was hey we've been we can compile knrc that from 1971 probably not literally true but um and we've needed to carry on that legacy so all of the defaults are busted and you should do hold it this way instead. Um, so yeah. Anyway, Connor, when when you played that clip, I I feel like there was both agreement but reluctant agreement, especially because we've got the the stink of rust hanging on us. And I think that <laughs> uh, I think you know, like accepting observations, even observations just parroted from C plus plus books by folks associated with Rust, is like tough to handle. Yeah. No, and and to get back when uh, Brian, you mentioned about backwards compatibility, like that is completely correct, and is going to I think retrospectively looking back on it play an important role in like how these languages, like how the cookie crumbles, because inside the inner C plus plus community, it's a well known thing that at one of the three committee meetings that take place annually. One of them was actually the last one before the pandemic was in Prague, Czechia uh, at the beginning of 2020 in February. 
it, uh, there was a big meeting. So like, and for those that aren't, um, uh, that are listening, that aren't familiar, the way that C++, uh, it has an ISO um, standard, and there's basically a collection of folks, you know, back in the day, it was, I think, only 30 or 50 that would meet at these meetings, but now it's up to 250, 300. And it's a week-long meeting that they rotate between Europe and North America, and they have three meetings a year, once every four months. And there are a bunch of different groups that meet and focus on library evolution and language evolution. And so one of these was in 2020, uh, in February, right before the pandemic or right when it was starting. And I was at, I for a couple years was attending these um, and was at that meeting. And there was this, I think it was a two or three hour session talking about, should we change the sort of status quo of not breaking backwards compatibility like and there's some people listening that they're thinking oh i know this feature that feature we technically did uh you know take out there are there are a handful of things you can point at but in general it is an unspoken rule that you do not break backwards compatibility because that's one of the strengths and reasons that c plus plus became so popular was because of its backwards compat with c right and that's really true right almost, i mean that is certainly true i mean that that is certainly a very important it plays a very important role yeah, and and this this you know uh, question of how to evolve is uh, playing a large role in the design decisions of these different successor initiatives. You know, CPP Front or CPP Two is aiming to just basically be at the moment take the CP the C Front route, which is just basically a syntax that transpiles down into existing C plus plus code. Whereas Carbon out of Google is aiming to have a really good interop story, but it's going to be a different language. Whereas Rust, you know, doesn't really have a great, at the moment, C++ interop story. But uh, to, to wrap up, you know, long story short, of this meeting took place, and the, the vote that happened at the end basically was like, we're not going to change the status quo. And that was the meeting that Google, who was one of the largest investors in C++, they, the... Uh, the chair or the, the editor of the standard worked at Google, uh, Chandler Carruth, along with that, that individual was Richard Smith, who was one of the three people sort of leading the leadership team on Carbon. And Chandler Carruth was, I believe, running one of the, the, the groups there. Like So a lot of very senior people with many decades or years of experience uh, basically, I don't want to say pick up and left the committee, but that's essentially what happened. And, you know, you know modulo a few details. So it was a couple really important folks as well as their coworkers basically pivoted from well we care about perf we have our own library at google called absale that has all these you know data structures that aren't standard but are faster because the hash map that we implemented you know isn't able to do x y and z because we can't break backwards compatibility and now they're working on carbon and in hindsight some folks i i'm sure are going to say like that was a mistake in c++'s history like the folks in the room, I don't think, understood the implications of making the decision to continue maintaining backwards compatibility. And that's not to say that like Google and the folks there want to break every three years, but like they were like C++ was not solving the problem that they were using it for. And so now this is why, you know, uh, carbon is a thing. And I've heard out of multiple folks on the committee basically start to talk about maybe we should have like a once every 30 year ABI break um, that gives us the uh, possibility of, oh, you know, once every 30 year, something ABI like that break. It's like a yeah. jailbreak or something that is like a, it's like a solar flare. I mean, it's like, I'm trying to think like, what's the analog? It's like, Oh my God, we're coming oh, up it's on like, the 20th. Yeah. Haley's comment. ABI yeah, break. exactly. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I sort of uh, enjoy the hubris of it. Like Brian, maybe every thirty years on the podcast, we should do something special. I think. I, <laughs> yeah, I do. Yeah, exactly. Uh, like without fail. Certainly every sixty. I feel. I mean, <laughs> sure. I mean, sure. For, for for a podcast that will last ten thousand years, that you know, that that only adds up. <laughs> that, 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 that's a lot. If you think about it. Yeah. Um, I mean, it is, and I boy, do I see both sides of that? Because on the one hand. I mean, yeah, obviously, like we need to evolve the the language, and we need to do it in ways that break things. But I got the other side of it. Honestly, is like, hey, wait a minute. If we're like the value of this thing is its backwards compatibility, and if you're going to eliminate that, I will just go to a different language that actually doesn't have the. I mean, I, I mean, this is like 
you know that that they they say that the totalitarian regimes are are most likely to be toppled when they try to reform because mm. you know you, you you are trying to actually not i guess i mean not to compare c plus plus to a totalitarian <laughs> regime but i i guess i just did but that the you know that when you have glasnost and perestroika it's like yeah it's most likely to lead to the fall of the soviet union because you know people don't want to have like a little freedom they want to have a lot they want to have all of it and it's like i would say that i uh i would question if i were in c plus plus i'd be like wait a minute if i'm like if we are going to add on the one hand i want to add things like patterns to i mean and, i mean for me in i'm rust i know adam you and i have talked about this in the past but boy like just just pattern matching alone just pattern it's like so changes the way you write software at such a deep level that um i would not want to not have that and i i kind of think that that was one of the things you're saying is like that is not going to happen um or is um and i don't know if that's for backwards compatibility reasons or not i mean how many of these things are not happening because it's impossible to make them backwards compatible um versus uh because i think the other thing that is you can have the kind of the the, the 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 scepter of backwards compatibility where you can actually do quite a bit without breaking it um but that the, that said c++ has got a lot of really strange behavior that it's got to be backwards compatible with i mean pattern matching is in the evolution pipeline and it was first brought to the committee back before the c++ uh, 17 standard in fact it was initially brought as a single proposal with uh, variant, aka C++ as some type, if you're familiar with algebraic data types, aka the equivalent of enums in Rust. And yep. the committee said this proposal is too big, split them up. Variant ended up getting in as a language fe- as a library feature in C++ 17. And pattern matching has had a whole history of initially there was one proposal, then there was two competing proposals. I think there's only two active competing proposals, but at one point, like while there was two competing, there was a third one that showed up um, that Herb Sutter was proposing, like is and as, which I definitely don't think is going to happen. Um, but anyway, so now there's multiple competing proposals, but you know this has been going on a decade now of uh, you know trying to get this in. And I, you know, Bryce says he doesn't think it, it'll ever ship. I do think at some point. Uh, pattern matching pattern matching will get in but also it's it's not going to be anywhere like if you read the proposals the syntax so that's the thing is i don't think really there's much that c++ can't implement because of backwards compatibility other than like changing the defaults and and you know like we got lambdas in in c++11 and that was already on top of like a, a bunch of stuff some people would say a ball of mud but like we got it in the syntax for it is absolutely atrocious compared to right. A language like Haskell or even Rust, like you need every single type <laughs> of 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 you know I'm 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 a, a pedant when it comes to the naming of braces and brackets and parentheses, but you need every single one of those. You need you know the the brackets for your capture list, even if you're not capturing anything. Uh, you need the parentheses for your parameter list, which you can omit if you have no parameters. Before that, you need your uh, chevron, you know, angle brackets. Uh, which was, I think, added in 14 or 17 if you want to templatize uh, your parameters. And then you need your braces for the body of the lambda, plus a couple semicolons at the end of your lambda, unless if it's immediately immediately invoked. Anyways, like, you know, C++ engineers, they're paid well, but it's like, it's to learn all this stuff. And and then you look at a modern language and you're like, wow, like, I look at Haskell and my mind is blown. It's like, you need two parentheses and that's it to right. form a section, right. which is just like a, a shorthand for, for... And so like, C++ does and is able to implement these language features. It just ends up looking, you know, I I don't want to say horrific compared to other languages, but it's just a lot worse because we're doing it on top of, you know, 30 years of of history, which uh, is unfortunate, but, you know, so pattern matching will probably show up. It's not going to look as beautiful as Rust or, you know, any functional language that has first-class support for ADTs and pattern matching and such, but... You know, it is what it is. Uh, the 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 committee is doing the best they can, you know, with what they are are trying to achieve, which is backward compatibility. And so, what is the disposition towards Rust? Because I, I did think one of the things that was interesting, and I don't know how representative kind of Bryce is on this, but um, <laughs> the fact that Adam is emblematic of everything that's wrong with Rust, because <laughs> <laughs> um, I, the, the uh, Adam Rust supervillain. Um, because I, I did think it was kind of interesting that there was a bit of othering going on in terms, uh, and and this is where you do get to kind of uh, some of the of of the tribalism that I do think 
is problematic, right? When you, I think it's, it actually is really important that we develop our own domains of expertise and languages and systems and so on. But we also need to look outside of them for innovation that's happening elsewhere to kind of bridge the, and I don't know, Connor, I mean, you're obviously someone who, who has done that because you are in, in different languages and so on. But I, it feels like that's not always happening. It's true of all communities, I think. I think all communities have this problem to, to a greater or lesser degree. Uh, first of all, is that a fair read? What, what is the disposition, actually? Let me ask this. What is the disposition towards Rust in the C++ community if there's a prevailing one? I think it is a smorgasbord. Like, it depends on... If you ask the community as a whole, like, you're not going to get a singular answer. Right. Yeah, right, right, right. I, I definitely know there are a number of folks that are actively on the committee that are huge fans of Rust. Um, I, I won't name any by name, but I've definitely uh, <laughs> seen folks on panels and seen folks in talks that are alluding to, like, look at how Rust does this. You know, isn't this awesome? I wish we could have this. Uh, so yeah, there are sure. definitely people that, you know, are actively working on evolving C++ and paying very close attention. And I think for some of them, they actually like Rust better than C++, but they work at a company where, you know, they're not going to be, you know, taking their tech stack, which has millions, if not, you know, tens or hundreds of millions of code written in C++, um, and importing that to Rust. So um, there's definitely folks like that. I think that there are other folks that are, are not big fans of Rust. I know uh, several people personally um, on the committee and off the committee that there are just certain things that Rust does not have the capabilities of doing. I think the number one thing that comes up is uh, variadic generics. And like, I've literally heard this quote that like a language without support for variadic generics, like I, it's just a non-starter for me. And <laughs> I've, 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 I've both, I've, ta I've asked this question to a lot of folks uh, to try and appease those people. Like, how do you deal with a kind of problem? You know, like my, the easiest one or my favorite, cause it's kind of algorithmic is, we, we got a new uh, quote-unquote algorithm in C++23 called uh, zip transform, which basically is the combination of zip and map. So instead of having to destructure the tuple that a zip will give you, it'll just automatically apply uh, your binary or, or whatever arity operation to your zip together sequence, which is a nice convenience. But if you try to spell that in Rust, uh, you know, it looks okay in the, in the case where you're zipping together two sequences. Um, but what if you're trying to do that over three sequences or four sequences? And I asked a Rust pro this, and he said his answer was, I would just zip twice in succession so that the type, that, the tuple type that you end up with is a tuple where the first element is a tuple and the second element is just your element. And so, but because you have destructuring in the uh, parameter list of your lambdas in Rust, you, can, you know the shape of that tuple, and so you can just destructure everything, call the internal elements A, B, and C, and you're done with it, which is not as elegant as what you can do with C++ because our zip transform is variadic. You can, you can uh, zip as many sequences as you want and apply the corresponding operation with an arity that is equal to the number of sequences you zip. So like in this one tiny example, like because C++ has very added generics, we have a more elegant way of solving this problem. And when I pointed that out to the guy, he was like, well, honestly, that's true, but like this is a very specific example. And the niceties that I get from the tooling and the language and the memory saf safety and like everything that I get with Rust is like, I would rather pay that cost of like having to write that, you know, or there's an iZip macro if I really don't want to zip twice in a row. And, uh, and so like his sort of response is like, I acknowledge this isn't as nice in Rust, but like, I don't care. Rust is a, a way nicer language. And like, I will, I will pay that cost when I have to pay it. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, that, I'm not sure that was a long winded answer to some folks love Rust. Some people won't touch it because it's missing certain features. Um, I think others have a ton of experience and not like a not, sunk cost isn't the right word, but they, they don't want it to be in a situation where Rust is now the, the go-to systems language and C++ goes the way of COBOL because then their 30, 40 years of experience is uh, okay. going to need yeah. to be translated. And I think that's actually a huge issue. Like I've talked to some folks and it's very hard to have a conversation about Rust because they, it's almost like an emotional reaction. Like totally. you're, you're trying to like, uh, you know, devalue all my expertise. And it's like, whoa, I'm not, I'm not trying to, that's not what I'm trying to do here. I'm just trying to like point out that Rust has a lot of great stuff that like C++ doesn't. 
sure it's missing x y and z but does that does that make it uh not as good a language as c plus plus like uh anyways I'll, i i feel like someone joined this the speaker table and i'll let i'll let folks respond to what i said yeah so it, and yeah we're gonna get uh cliff in here in a second um well so a couple of things come to mind one i just to, to take your latter point there I, and i think that this is really important because i've seen this in a couple of different communities I definitely saw this in, in c when java and the kind of when it was java 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 um and as i were adam and i literally ate at a cafe called the java java at sun and everything was java 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 and it felt like anything that was not java was was uh legacy and the, the, there's a there's a sense of fear and i think that um you know I've, I've recommended this talk in the past but rachel stevens gave a terrific talk at last year's monktoberfest on the the, the the root of much kind of bad behavior is fear um, and fear and the kind of the fear to get, being able to, to express that fear is really important because I think people feel personal fear. They feel like, I mean, just to counter to your point of like, wait a minute, if we're going to discard the language, I mean, am I getting discarded? Um, am I, is my expertise no longer valued if we no longer value this, this particular artifact? And uh, that, that's really tough. You know, th that's really tough to kind of confront directly. And, but I think it is actually really important to, to, to confront it directly. The other thing I, I, just, I think it was coming to mind, kind of, you're talking about variadic generics. And I guess I've never, really, I've never used variadic generics. So I don't know how life changing they are. And this is where I'm going to want to turn it over to Cliff to get, to get his perspective. But it just does seem to be like the narcissism of small differences, where it's like the, the, the difference. I mean, like, okay, so if we add variadic generics to Rust, I mean, what, or if they are added, I should say, I should say we, because I would have nothing to do with that. What would be, would, what would be the next thing? It would it be an even smaller difference, but Cliff, you've used very generic and C++. You've done a lot of C++ work and obviously a lot of Rust work. Um, what, what's your, what's your kind of take on these two different communities? Oh, okay. So the end of that sentence kind of changed the question. I'm, I'm not oh, sorry. Sure. You, you, you answered right away. But, rather answer. uh, I miss very generics. Holy crap. Uh, I was saying this in chat, like they're one of those C++ 11 features where you mostly only use them inside of libraries, like if you're writing a boost library, but the effect that they can have on ergonomics for your end users is just massive. And when people say Rust doesn't need this, I point to the function types, which effectively, sort of like how Go has generics as long as you're Rob Pike, uh, C++ <laughs> or Rust has gen uh, variadic generics as long as you're writing the support for the function types, which effectively are variadic generics for the arguments. Now, that's not really how they're implemented, but the thing this would let us do if we had it, and I'm not sure that we should add it, but if, if we did, is to be able to implement like a trait for all possible tuple types without having to write it for two tuples and three tuples and four tuples and so forth. Got it. Which is, you know, is kind cool. of yeah, that'd awkward, be but at the same time, like, is this enough for me not to use the language? Well, certainly not right now. And I, I did want to add something about fear. So um, I've been trying to figure out how to talk to, you know, ha talk to your kids about Rust. I've been trying to figure out how to talk to people about <laughs> Rust in a way that they'll be receptive of for several years now since I was trying to do it at Google. And uh, I think you're absolutely right about fear. And we also run into a problem, which is that due to the demographics of systems programming, and I'm saying this as an aging white guy, uh, we're not great at talking about fear. Like, totally. I have brought up fear as a as an origin for this, and I have had people explode at me and end the conversation. Uh, it's fear. So <laughs> must it's, be like, it's confirmed. Often, and I, I totally sympathize with fear. Like, it's the yeah. same sort of thing I feel like if I'm like, if I've invested a lot of time getting good at Rust, like if another language, if Carbon were to win out, would my time be wasted? Which I don't think it would because... I've learned a bunch of stuff, but you know, I, I I sympathize. So I think if we could get better at talking about the things that we're afraid of and the things we're trying to achieve, and not focusing so much on turning it into adversarial, I think it would work better for all of us. I think also if we can kind of find ways to allow people to move into a different world, and I mean, Cliff, you and I have talked about this in the past about kind of bringing, a, you know what elements of the old world can they kind of bring with them as a comfort? And certainly the one that, that comes to mind, and Adam, I don't know where you are on this, but certainly in when I first started implementing in Rust, all of my comments were C-style comments, or I should say, I guess, PL1-style comments, um, but were of the slash star star slash variety. Yeah. And 
I don't know. Are you? I don't know if you ever, if you went through this phase uh, or where I, you are. I did but. the same thing, but I, you know, I embraced Rust format. I think much earlier than you did, and um, and actually also tried to convince some of our other colleagues, like Dave Pacheco, about the the beauty of Rust format. And Rust format sort of uh, cured me of my C style comments because it fucked them up every way. In it, fact, it, it I've contributed. I've yeah. contributed multiple PRs to Rust format basically as an apology to Dave for forcing him to use Rust <laughs> format with his C style comments. But yeah, I, I, I brought the new, a little bit of the old world with me too. And I felt like that was like that. I, that was like psychologically important for me personally, as I was kind of venturing into the new world of rust. And this is obviously coming from, from C and not C plus plus. And then it was also like, it's also true that like C plus plus comments, it's like, now you get to like the, you know, the, 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 the college relationship with that ended poorly. And, um, and I'm realizing Adam, this is going to completely come full circle because you and I, I find myself missing is now C plus plus style comments in D trace. In D. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which is uh well 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 look who's yeah, adding look. <laughs> a new cup so I'll, I'll, i've got to get that fixed at some point but so i i think that like you know and cliff i'd be curious about what your thoughts are having dealt with i mean you've dealt with a lot of folks coming to rust from different languages and what you know what have been kind of where you see them having allergic reactions that are like not well-founded that are just kind of like part of this like this is different and that therefore i am I'm attacking it only because it's different versus like, Hey, just take a second and, and learn it. Oh boy. <laughs> so it's super easy for us. I think people who interact with code all the time as our job, as our hobby, as a significant fraction of our life to be really sensitive around syntax. So I'm just going to skip yep. right past that. Um, <laughs> Cause I think that affects every language and I don't think it's very, I mean, on some level, it's interesting as a human factors issue, but it's it's not very interesting in what it tells us about Rust or C++ or anything like that. It's just unfamiliar bad. Um, yeah. Some of the things I ran into early on have since been fixed, but like, uh, so Rust has opinions about the fact that types should be capitalized, for instance. And this actually caused an engineer I respect a lot to completely bounce off the language first thing because oh. that, that seemed incredibly foreign to him. And... Uh, at the time, the lint you had to turn on to get the compiler to shut up about that was called allow bad style. <laughs> <laughs> so that was kind of rude, and we fixed it. No, I'm oh, not, that's it's great. not a value judgment. You just have to disable value judgments in order to be able to compile your code. So what's the, yeah, wow. Yeah, so that, that was, I think whoever did that in the compiler probably didn't think about it that way, and it, it is now different. Yeah. Other than that, I think a lot of people bounce off of Rust because of the complexity. Um, coming from C++, uh, the, you're less likely, I think, to bounce off due to complexity, but Rust has more going on than C or than Python. And I, it, it's at an interesting sort of point of irreducible complexity if you want to have certain goals. Uh, memory safety and trait-based generics are the two big ones that have interesting interactions. And I feel like you could write an entire book on this. Um, I was actually talking to Brian about this this morning, but like, I think Rust is complicated. I also don't see what to remove and maintain the goals that I'm trying to get out of the language. So uh, Zig, for instance, um, decided to punt on both memory safety and race condition safety in the language design, which is a trade-off you can make. I would be, and, and Zig is a much simpler language as a result, but I want, freedom from data races and memory safety. And I would love to see a much simpler language achieve those while maintaining Rust's bare metal performance characteristics. I'm just not sure how to do it. Uh, I haven't seen an existence proof yet. So uh, when, when somebody has it, please send me a link. Yeah, and I think that it's, I mean, the other thing, it, just because of, of this kind of grand bargain that Rust makes with you, I mean, Rust brings so much to you, but you got to meet it a little bit you, you, you've got to travel a little bit and i think that the distance that you have to travel i mean i do think it's you've got to learn it i mean you it's very and adam i mean this is like your I mean, original blog, rush blog post from back in the day that if you try to kind of like bounce around and then when when you were learning it there were like there, there's like the compiler was in a different state there were less resources available there were fewer books on it there was no narrative to go on 
and it was just harder to not like bounce through it. But you really do need to sit down and be like, I'm going to take this time to really learn this. You just can't copy and paste off the internet the way you can with some of the languages, frankly. I mean, you can do that with Go, I think. I mean, I don't mean that. And I don't, that, that's not pejorative. I think that, that is, that's, that's arguably a strength. Um, and you can certainly do that with JavaScript and not really know what exactly is going on and still have a functional system. But then, you know, you've kind of shifted the cognitive load away and then it comes to bite you later is kind of the rust thesis. And that's not, that's not a fit for everybody. I do think it's actually really important to know that bargain going in. Because I have to say, the, the uh, programming rust book, the O'Reilly book, makes this really explicit about this bargain that you're striking. And it did like really help change my disposition to the power checker of like, okay, I need to like really just, I, I, instead of just trying to kind of throw myself at this thing and bloodying myself against this immovable object, I need to like step back and appreciate what it's giving me and be willing in particular to change the structure of my program. Because Cliff, I think that's like a pretty big and important thing in Rust that you, if you've got a preconceived notion of how you're going to implement it coming from C or C++, Rust may want to dis Rust may want you to consider a different approach. Absolutely, and and there's a lot of data structures and even some algorithms that don't work well in Rust because we haven't yet figured out how to explain to the compiler in a formally provable manner that they don't violate aliasing, that they don't, uh, you know, reuse pointers outside of their appointed lifetime, and I right particularly in in things like graph algorithms i approach things very differently than i would in c++ and i have to and that was a hard learning curve for me consisting of a lot of cursing and going back to other languages early on uh but you know is this a good feature of rust not necessarily the code i produce is sometimes more efficient than it would have been but sometimes it's not and i think different languages want different shapes Want different. Uh, fourth is my. Um, this is this is probably not going to resonate super well with the audience, but um, fourth is my oh, go-to example of this. Is that like fourth really is a language that needs different approaches to things than most other languages, and the way that you do something ergonomically in a way that will be maintainable is very different from how you do it in C. Yeah. And I feel like the C to Rust gap is in many ways similar, less similar than the C to um, Haskell gap, for instance. Uh, but yeah. C to Haskell being a bigger gap, in other words. C to Haskell is a, is a much larger gap, yes. Yeah. It, I mean, a, uh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to comment on what uh, Cliff said, is that I've had this conversation with a luminary of the C++ community who has I won't name, but has given keynotes at large conferences and almost any C++ developer that, you know, watches talks and listens to podcasts will know their name. And their opinion is that what Cliff just said, and I know, Brian, you've, you've made this point, I think it was in your, you know, Rust OS talk, that, you know, the, the folks that show up at Rust's door and try and do a doubly linked list and then have trouble with it, and they say, okay, I can't do this, you know, rust bad. Uh, like, this person's opinion is that if I can't, if, I, if you're telling me that I can't, you know, implement a linked list or a doubly linked list easily, then it's just a bad language. Like, you're, you're telling me I can't express that? Like, how, how, how should me needing to go down a different path, how is that, like, you know, the, the, the correct way or like, it, anyway, so like I've, I've had this conversation being like trying to quote, basically paraphrase what you've said before, Brian, and what you just said, Cliff. And there it's just like a, it's a, it's a stone wall being like, you, you can't tell me that I'm not allowed to do like program the way I know how to program. And I'm like, well, okay. Uh, and it's, it's a, it's an impasse. Like I've, I've had zero success yeah. with certain individuals telling them and, and paraphrasing what you've said in your talks and what you just said, Cliff, like, they just don't uh, accept that as like an acceptable answer. I actually completely agree. Yeah. And I think that's, a, that's an underappreciated thing people bounce off of, is bringing a data structure you're very familiar with. For me, it was intrusive doubly linked lists, which like in an operating system kernel with real-time requirements, intrusive doubly linked lists are a great data structure. They're also really difficult to get 
right for an expansive definition of right. And so one of the things I've been doing recently is trying to write a correct one in C. And the definition of correct that you use there is really important. The number of things you have to document that you cannot do, for example, struct return, struct assignment, that the compiler won't stop you from doing. But you know anything with internal pointers, struct assignment is not safe. Uh, Rust knows this, and as a result, will reject your program. That's not great. Uh, it'd be nice if your program would work. But I think one of the things that's underappreciated about particularly intrusive doubly linked lists in other languages is like they are relatively error prone and pretty easy to come out with dangling pointer errors. And that's actually uh, the reason why they're hard in Rust, more or less. Totally. And Cliff, it's funny you mentioned that because that was basically for me too. It's like I was I was re implementing this thing that had used uh, um, in a, uh, an intrusive AVL tree, which we use all over the place in the kernel. And and they ported to use land, and it was it's just like it's super easy to use. Um, I am like really curious, Adam, because you've obviously used Libavia a lot too. Yeah. What implicit things do we know to avoid with it? Um, I'm not sure. I mean, it's I, I think that the, the big thing that you give up there is that it you it it cannot. I mean, it is very uh, it leaves much up to the thing that it is being embedded in. So. There is no locking in libavl. It's like that's up to you. That and so and and Cliff, I don't know. Maybe that, from your perspective, that'd be like, well, that's a like easy to get wrong for sure. Um, and I mean, it as is, long but as, as long as something in the type system prevents you from using that code across threads, but that's not a feature in C, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah right. that would be a negative. I mean, like when you're deleting something, an entity that exists in multiple trees, I feel like I'm guaranteed. That's a guaranteed like parsex in terms yeah, of totally. getting that right. And there's a great power I'm, in that, like, you've got an object that can be on, like, you know, five different data structures simultaneously, and with which we definitely do in the kernel, Atom. With, I mean, there's a lot of ZFS data absolutely. structures in particular that were on, like, a lot of different trees at once. And yeah, uh, easy to get that wrong. Um, easy, easy to forget that you were. Uh, so the, the, there, there's a peril but, there for sure. I haven't used that particular library, but off the top of my head from your description of it, I suspect that there's a couple of things that are potential footguns here. One is that. You've got very, what I would describe as challenging alias situation there with your with your thing in multiple trees that may have other overlapping nodes. And so deleting things, as Adam pointed out, can be very challenging. But even just mutating things safely could be challenging uh, because of aliasing. The other thing is, particularly if you've got an object that can be a member of multiple intrusive data structures, like an intrusive linked list or an AVL tree, you always wind up needing to upcast I guess it depends on your pers or downcast. Uh, you, you need to be able to go from a link, uh, a, a node that's reached by the pointers in the generic data structure up to the container type. That method, which is either punning and assuming it's at offset zero in the struct, which please don't do that, or a container pointer, which you can totally afford, please use a container pointer. Um, that in itself is another thing that is easy to get wrong, particularly if the struct is moved or if the uh, container pointer is corrupted or otherwise initialized wrong. So uh, these are a couple of things that if I were interacting with a library like that, I would be keeping in mind to try to avoid doing wrong. Totally. And when you create the ABL tree, you are indicating, uh, the, you're indicating the offset in the structure that contains it. So, I mean, that's kind of very explicit in the contract. Oh, wow. Um, so you're, you're calling like offset of and, and telling it on creation? Yep, yep that's right. Yep. I'm sure nobody ever gets that wrong. <laughs> um, you know, it's like it, 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 you. It, well, I would say it's it's not that I, I think you don't actually get that wrong because if you do get that wrong, it's just like nothing works at all. I think what it does mean though is that there are just like huge compromises that you're making that then become, and in particular, like obviously because it's intrusive data structure, it, you've got no ability to turn that into a smarter data structure. That's going to be an AVL tree, not a B tree. The end. Right? There's just no yeah. real way around that. And Plus, since you're working in C, you're inevitably going to wind up casting a void star to some specific type. So if you insert a thing with the wrong type, that can become very exciting. Yeah, and the and I think that we, you know, the reason we did we did that obviously is for memory efficiency. I mean, the reason you use an intrusive data structure is for memory efficiency for for, for performance. And for me, the thing that I had to let go of it when I was 
well, one, I had to let go of this. I actually really tried hard to make this work in Rust, and I'm just not smart enough. Is what it boils down to. I mean, I was just like, I am just getting mauled. And uh, I, you know, there's the Cliff. There's that blog entry, so you really want to write a doubly linked list in Rust. And like the tone of the blog entry is like, don't do this. Which apparently, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, don't do this. Page down. I want okay, net, yeah, let's do this. And they're like, no, seriously, like, don't do this. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah let's. But I want to go do that. It's like, hey, hey, how many warnings do you need, pal? Before you just like, don't do this. I mean, and, part of it is that until fairly recently, the semantics around that were formally undefined in Rust. So I've got one on GitHub that's a worked example of a doubly linked intrusive list that I believe to be correct-ish, and that will. I see Ben Kimak in the audience. Uh, uh, it. Th this will actually pass tests on Miri, which is the undefined behavior checker uh, for Rust, one, one of the undefined behavior checkers. But I use that data structure because of the determinism it provides, but it is uh, implementing it in Rust certainly makes me make very explicit all of the things that would have been comments in my C implementation. And I agree with that tutorial that this is not a beginner task. It really is not. And then it's, and when, if you were to bounce off the language, then it's it would just be sad because it's like you're bouncing off the language for kind of the wrong reasons. It's like you have kind of accidentally put yourself into something that is just that the language makes really, really hard because of the things it gives you on the other. And I think if you kind of go into it thinking of like, I'm going to get these kind of magical things if I'm willing to change my thinking, um, it's and I, I and I think that we, you know, it's in Cliff, you've got a terrific blog series on learning Rust the unsafe way um, for C programmers in particular um, as um, uh, and, and, and what's, what's been the reception to that actually? I mean, the people I hear from, the reception has been pretty good. I don't know what the reception's like among the people I don't hear from, obviously. Yeah, I guess that's fair. <laughs> I suspect, I mean, I, I guess I could go search the orange site, but I don't as a matter of policy. And um, that that's actually my second attempt at convincing my C programming friends because most of my friends are systems programmers, uh, at least work friends, and um, convincing my C programming friends that maybe they should give Rust a try, that it's that it's something that might be interesting at their level because my first one was um, well, it's still on my website. Uh, it, shall we say less tactful and was far less effective. Um, <laughs> So I, I regrouped and took a different approach and tried to be, and this comes back to some degree to the fear thing we were talking about earlier, but also to the cultural holdovers and, and cultural comforts that you mentioned earlier, seeing that you will be able to do this and still apply your skills, right? That you will be able to take some of the data structures, you know, from your past life and apply them that, and, and this is actually a point that I think is underappreciated that I was hoping to get to in a future section of that, except that I, got a different job instead. Um, the There are a lot of data structures I use in Rust that I would not use in C. And it's because they would be cowboy in C, like loaning sure. sections of my stack to other threads, like um, you know, sh sharing alias pointers to my stack with an interrupt handler. There are things um, I can do in Rust that I can do that I know would fail at compile time if I got them wrong that I would never have reached for in C. So it's not like there's a one-sided trade-off where you can't do the data structure in Rust. It's each language has data structures it's better at and data structures that it's less good at. Yeah, well, it, and I think that it, it, just to the, like how you kind of think about how to phrase some of that. And I mean, it, again, it's interesting about your like less effective approach versus more effective approach because i think it is really important to let you know those that are kind of coming to i'm going I'm to take on a bunch of change with this new language and to know that it's like this does not invalidate your your previous experience and this doesn't invalidate what you've done and to the contrary it's like you want to bring some of that with you but you need to like kind of there's some of that you're going to need to leave behind or at least phrase differently things like the double link list but then there are other things that I think are going to be really valuable. And I think one of the things I like about Rust is it does take from a bunch of different languages in terms of like it borrows wherever it can, I feel. And when, good, when things are added, Rust pun, like, actually. What's that? That's a pretty good Rust pun. <laughs> um, the, but I think that that's really important. And I, I, 
that that I think is part of why you know you're going to find things whatever language you come from you're going to find things like okay there are things here that actually this actually makes sense someone was here before me that had my same disposition and has left something that's added to the language that I am delighted by and I think there's a, like there's a lot of that stuff but you got to get over that initial hump to get to it. Yeah, I initially underestimated the fact that for a lot of us, particularly those of us who have been doing this for decades, the, the uh, adopting a new language is not an intellectual argument. It is an emotional argument, and you have oh. to approach it as such. People will take it very personally. People will identify with their language, even if they don't realize they're doing it. And I should have seen that coming because I see people in the Rust community doing the same thing. So we all do it. So you have to be careful attacking C to make sure that you explain that, like, no, you're not bad for writing C. Like, I've written a lot of C. I still do it from time to time. But, like, here's a different tool you might consider using sometimes. I also think that uh, Rust will make you a better C programmer. It'll definitely I think make you a, a, a more frightened C programmer, speaking for Rust, myself. Rust made me the world's most annoying C++ code reviewer, to be perfectly honest. This started to be a right. problem at Google. <laughs> like, if once you are reading people's structures and, and, like, back annotating the lifetimes that you would need to express to do these things in Rust... I don't know. I, the, the number of aliasing bugs that you can find reading an average code base is quite high and, or potentially. I, I could, yeah, I could imagine you saying, well, how do you know that, you know, th that this operates in this particular way or has this particular lifetime and those arguments probably ending with, because I said so, or because I'm pretty sure that that's true enough already cliff. Yeah. So the review tends to end with, well, can you please mention that in the comment on the function? <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's a, I mean, I think it's another reason to like, get, and I think that it's also just valuable to get out of to try other systems, no matter what. Like to do, go do, uh, to implement new languages and to try out different things, try out different systems. Because if nothing else, it just it keeps it it tamps down some of the fear associated with tech tribalism. And I think when that fear begins to feed on itself, that's when you get to. Yeah, I think you just get into a bunch of really bad behavior. It's just not constructive. Yeah, that's, that's when things get gross and we don't make progress as a trade. We don't make progress as an industry when we're too focused on that. And yeah. I see a lot of people in the Rust community criticizing C++ who probably don't have significant C++ experience. And I think it would probably be really helpful for a lot of these people to go spend some time writing some serious C++. Like, which might sound like a weird recommendation for me, but like C++ has things to teach you. Rust has things to teach you. I don't know that you should write C++ in your avionics firmware or anything where it could kill people. It, that's my, you know, that's my well-known bias, but like go learn C++, go learn Haskell, go learn Erlang. Like these all have things to teach you. And frankly, Haskell will make you a better C programmer. I don't know how, but it will because it'll stretch your brain. So Go play with C++ and see what you bring back. One of my favorite quotes is from Guy Steele when he was doing an AMA at PLDI. I want to say it was 2020 or 2021. It was one of the ones that was virtual during the pandemic. And he just had this one small quote that was, I love all programming languages. And then he went on to follow up to say that, you know, there's too much, not like dunking, but just, you know, Folks and communities like to kind of, you know, go back and forth. And he thinks it's a real shame because there is something, regardless of your personal feelings of, a, you know, insert any language, you can, there's always something to learn from that language. Even if it is a language that is sunset, even if it's a language that you would never use to solve whatever problem that you're currently solving, like you can learn something from every single programming language. And like we would be in a better place if we did more like trying to understand what are the superpowers of this language versus like why my language is better than your language. And I, I think like that is like my, my personal like ethos is that I don't think folks should go and learn, you know, insert language, APL, Haskell, whatever, because they should go and, you know, convince their company to start using that language. But there are things to learn from every programming paradigm. And that one of my favorite uh, tweets is by Ben Dean, who's one of my favorite speakers. And he has this tweet along with a blog that says, everyone should go and learn uh, 
e- e- one of the following languages like from this paradigm, and it's like Smalltalk for OOP, you know, Haskell for functional programming, APL for array programming, Prolog for logic, and et cetera, et cetera. No ball for spring processing. Yeah, his, uh, his point being that like, d- I'm not telling you to go and learn this so that you can tell your company to switch. I'm telling you to go and learn it so that you can learn how to solve problems in that paradigm. And that will make you, it will enable you to put tools in your tool belt to then use those tools in whatever language that you use day to day. And uh, like, if you, if you know C++, going and learning, you know, Zig or Rust is not going to teach you as much as going and learning one of those other languages from a different paradigm, which uh, I, 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 love, I love that tweet. And I just, you know, I, I wish programming communities would would act more sort of in line with that. Yeah, I forget the term. Ex- I think it's disdain culture, but there's a there's a thing that a lot of us in the Rust community historically have tried to avoid and not necessarily succeeded. But the notion that you can like a thing without having to be shitty toward its competitors, like you can like C plus plus without having to dunk on Rust. You can like Rust without having to dunk on Excel spreadsheets. Um, you, <laughs> or C plus plus, right? And for systems programmers in particular, for the people that I uh, mentor, one of the things that I recommend is that they write a fourth implementation, like from bare metal. And I explain it as the fourth, and particularly a hand rolled fourth implementation, it's like a lightsaber. You should build one, you need to build one to sort of fully understand your trade and then hope that you never have to use it for anything. I. Boy, so when I when the fourth interpreter comes out, I've got this kind of image of you, Cliff, as Obi Wan with with your with your fourth interpreter. Uh, that's yeah, that and I think implementing a fourth interpreter as well with that. I mean, that's something that everyone can go do, and it's it's very. I mean, it's it's also educational about why fourth has been used, where fourth has been used, because yeah, you can implement a fourth interpreter in not much memory, as it turns out. Well. This is, uh, I think this is, this is a great note to end on. Connor, I, th- I, this is, uh, I, I think we, we have settled the beef between our two podcasts. <laughs> um, as you say, it's good for ratings. Um, I feel that, that it was, <laughs> um, but this has been, um, a lot of fun to have you on. Um, and I, I, I think that folks should check out your podcasts, not just ADSP, but also the, the, uh, it's a Raycast, right? Is the other, yeah. um, um, and then I think, uh, uh, Connor, we've got to have you back on to talk about more of those 70 podcasts that you find. If you find good podcasts, definitely uh, point us to them. We've got, obviously, folks here that are also uh, podcast listeners. So um, we'd, we'd love to love to hear that uh, your recommendations there. But I just think that you're, um, I mean, I think getting out of your comfort zone, learning about different communities, um, learning about the kind of the, the shared history of the domain, I think all of these things are really really effective for us as as a domain as a craft um and uh this the beef is settled and i think we all learned how to settle beef in the future um if i may give a quick quick plug adam for in the in the vein of arguably not settling beef but stirring some shit up uh, <laughs> I've got a talk at P99 Conf on Thursday. Um, this is a free online conference. Um, we had that great conversation with Kelsey Hightower on uh, corporate open source anti patterns, um, and I'm giving an update to that. Um, and then hosting a panel um, with uh, Adam Jacob and Ashley Williams, who are regulars on the podcast um, at P99. So that's going to be on. On uh, this coming Thursday, uh, and if you hopefully, if you're listening to this with enough time to attend, you can uh, join us live. Um, and uh, that will, I'm not sure that will be settling beef. I think that no, be I think that's going to be the opposite, but but yeah, or, it was uh, a brief moment, it was a nice moment we had there. It was a little nice moment. Now it's time to go, uh, to go pick some fights with some bad actors out there. Um, but no, that it's, um, I think that there's some things that need to be said. So looking forward to that. Um, and uh, Connor, thank you again, Cliff. Thank you um, for, for joining us. Uh, great to get your wisdom and uh, excited to uh, remain a listener to ADSP. Uh, it's really terrific stuff. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for inviting me on and also continue to do this. This is, I hope that this serves as a, uh, what do you call it? a mold for, you know, other companies that potentially are having meetings that there's no reason they couldn't hit a record button and put them out. 
it's honestly not as much work as folks would think. And uh, this is the first of its kind, I think, that, you know, if other companies were doing this, it would be, you know, awesome for, for folks that don't work at that company to be flies on the wall for those conversations. Yes, please. Uh, and please point Connor and us to it. We'll, uh, we'll be fans of your podcast too. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Thanks everyone. See you next time.